Welcome to the second episode of Late Night Talk Radio. And it's a dark night out here. And I hope that you're settled down somewhere warm and you've got your duvet over here and a fire on if you want. And I'm going to talk con- inconsequential things for the next couple of hours anyway. And as you know, that'll consist of custom of the day, something about foraging. And then we'll have legend of the week and a bedtime story. And at the end, we'll do something to help you sleep. I think I'm going to do a a sleep meditation, but we may do a little sleep story as well. Okay, and we'll have chapter two of the Midnight Folk for the bedtime story. So I want to say something now about our foraging, and hopefully this will be something we can repeat on a regular basis. If you listen to the first episode, you'll be aware that um, Sheila, who I live with, my partner, is uh, very into weeds and wild medicine and all sorts of things like that. But what that means is pretty much every week or so, we have to go looking for different things in the fields and woods and hedgerows. And this has unforeseen consequences sometimes. She's doing a course called Weeds and Wild Medicine. And so she's constantly experimenting and making things into tea, which I'm not certain you should make into tea. And I taste them and I think, well, they're all right. Actually, I probably prefer them to some of the herbal teas that you get. You know, you get these packets of herbal teas, black currant. They never taste very much to me. I always prefer ordinary tea, you know, black tea, such as we are brought up with in, uh, in the UK. And I guess some of the countries as well, the Irish have tea similar to us. Um, I'm not sure that the Americans do, probably the, the, the Australians and New Zealanders. And, oh, there's the rain again. The Canadians. Well, we've needed the rain, to be fair, because it's been a pretty dry summer. And I was a bit worried about some of the trees in the... We live near the river, and the river was quite low. But even there, the the trees were looking very sad. So it's rained a fair bit since the summer. I suppose we're in autumn now. And, well, we are technically. It's the something 21st of September. Anyway, I need to tell you about our foraging trip. This is very good time for foraging. You know, uh, autumn season of mists and mellow fruitfulness, as Keats said. So we went out and I drove to Castle Carrick. Now, Castle Carrick's a pretty little village. And it's on what they call the Eastern Fell side. So it's just where the river valley, the Eden Valley, starts to slope up to the the moorland of the Pennines. And that really was my first mistake because what we were out for, the task I was given, was to find some hawthorn berries and some rose hips. So I understand she's making a drink called hedgerow hedgerow drink, which sounds kind of, if you think it's leaves and things, it doesn't sound very nice. But when she says it's got hawthorn in and um, rose hips and I think she's putting ginger in, well, you won't get ginger growing around here, not as far as I know. So I think there are some additives that's maybe to make it a little bit more palatable. But anyway, I know in previous years, because rose hips are full of vitamin C, she's been made um, syrup and all sorts of stuff. The Hawthorns, I think this is a first this year, and it probably arises from the course, the Weeds and Wild Medicine course. Anyway, there were other berries, there were blackberries, which I ate them as I was going along, and elderberries, but we had had a lot of elderberries last weekend that she was making into, again, gin, I think, unfortunately. So we've got damson gin, slow gin and elderberry gin so anyway get on with the story went along this hedgerow and she said there's there's some rose hips you go in and just pick those okay so there was quite a lot of them about and i put my hand in and they weren't too thorny because you can imagine it can be a thorny problem getting rose hips you can get all cut up but it wasn't too bad and i picked the load and and i felt that i was a very good boy and i um 
I had a tub full of them. Anyway, I went back to them and she said, half of those are green. And of course, I'm red, green, colour blind. So this is a problem. This was one of the reasons I didn't become, I did my training. I'm a mental health nurse, but I did my training in physical health as well to become an advanced nurse practitioner. And it's better paid. So there was an opportunity for me to do that, but I can't see red. So people would, you know, my mentor would be saying to me, have a look in this, this person's ear. And I'd look, yeah, okay. You know, it's very red, go, is it? Or people would come in with rashes and they go, look at that. And I go, yeah, looks, looks just, I can't see anything. So it was a problem and I decided that I, I shouldn't do that job because I'd probably miss something and something terrible would happen. And this is, this is what happened with the rose hips. So she was quite understanding. She kind of remembered then. Oh, she said, oh, of course you can't see it. Anyway, um, we, we then, we got, we got enough and then we went home. So that's foraging. We haven't started on the mushrooms yet. I haven't really seen many mushrooms. I've been wandering about and I haven't seen many mushrooms, but I've seen... Oh, I'll tell you what we've got is conkers. So um, actually this leads me to a nice little interlude. So just hang on a second. So one of my patrons, Damon Bowles. Now, this is, a, this is also a good point for me to say, you know, if you're not a patron, you can get lots of things by becoming one. You can get every episode of the Classic Ghost Stories podcast as a sound file for you to download and listen to and, you know, sell if you want. Um, for a dollar a month, actually a dollar. Now, until the pound crashed this week, that was about one pound 13. I remember when it was dollars, but it was about one pound 50. But um, now, a dollar's, it was below a pound or something. So anyway, it's a good job we're back from the USA because that would have been even more expensive. But, but become a patron, one dollar a month. That's 25 cents a week. And you get, uh, you get communications from me, but you also, and you can join the Discord. You can join the Discord group uh, so we can have a chat on air, either through typing or chatty chatting with your ears and your mouth. And uh, anyway, Damon Bowles, one of my patrons, he said to me, listen to the first episode of the Late Night Talk Radio. And he said, there's a book you should get because I was kind of meandering about things. And it's called England in particular. And he said, it would be just right up your street. I said, it's called a celebration of the commonplace, the local, the vernacular and the distinctive. And it's compiled by Sue Clifford and Angela King from an organization called Common Ground. Well, when I worked, uh, paradoxically, it's not paradoxically, but you know what I mean, in Wales in the 90s, I, I had things to do with Common Ground. And they are kind of an organisation that celebrates local culture without kind of saying it's ours, keep off, you know. It's like, it's ours, we're really proud of it. Yeah, you want to come and have a read of it? Because, you know, one of my things was cultural appropriation that, you know, if, if I'm interested in Japanese things or Igbo things, you know, I should be... It should be okay for me to be interested in them and not keep in your lane type thing. So a common ground were like that. There's like, yeah, there's lots of things about England that are good. I don't know who that was. Um, and um, this book is a very big book. So it must have taken them, I don't know how long to compile. So it's got 540, no, it's got 455 pages. And when I first saw it, I looked on Amazon and it was 50 quid, 49 pounds. And I got this for three pounds 50 with free postage. Now everybody loves a bargain, particularly me. So I've got this really interesting book called England in particular, which is very big. It's a hardback book. I'm going to see what they say about conkers. When I leaf through it, I see there's no entry for conkers. But that, when I look in the index, is because it's under the posh name of horse chestnuts because the conkers are the nuts, the shiny brown nuts of the horse chestnut tree. So you have sweet chestnuts, which you can eat, and horse chestnuts, which I presume horses eat, but we can't. Actually, I think that the reason they're called horse chestnuts is when you break the leaf stem off, the, um, the join is in the shape of a horseshoe. I think that's why they're called horse chestnuts. And this is what Common Ground has to say. Introduced to England from the Balkans about 400 years ago. Just 400 years, that's nothing. This showy tree was originally deemed rather coarse in comparison to the sweet chestnut with its edible nuts. The horse is said to be pejorative, so their reason is they're just saying it's not as good as a, a real chestnut tree. It's like uh, dog violets and dog roses. 
they're not as good as real violets and real roses. So the Turks call it horse chestnut too. Yeah, I don't know what that's got to do with anything. Using its acin rich conchus to treat their steeds. Pharmaceutical companies are taking note. Mm. The association with the smithy, usually sited beneath the horse chestnut or lime on the edge of the village, may come in part from this. But also the horse chestnut casts a deep shade useful in hot summers to the extent that anyone finding horse chestnut and lime planted near a considerable bump in the ground should try searching for an ice house. I'll take that on board. I'm going to go out looking for limes together with horse chestnuts and I'm going to probably find some old ice houses or maybe not. This bold pyramid of a tree won praise from the artist Samuel Palmer, the pre-Raphaelites and Tennyson too, and was soon highly fashionable. By the 18th century, great avenues had been planted around stately homes and grand houses such as Windsor Castle, Berkshire, and in where the Queen used to live, poor lass, and in Bushy Park, north of Hampton Court, Middlesex, where 11th of May or thereabout is celebrated as Chestnut Sunday. A popular tree in towns and parks since mid-Victorian times, it is admired for its sticky buds, cut for vases, and is spectacular large lobed leaves. They are, they're very good. Among the first to unfurl in spring. Its flowers early too, with candles of pink and white blossoms. The conker trees do look nice in the spring. It, exactly like that. I hadn't thought about them as candles. And mainly I see them as white, but of course I am colourblind, as we just mentioned. Um, in autumn, the conkers arrive, yes freed from their hard green spiny cases, which can give you a bit of a prick. These shiny seeds make perfect gaming material. This is the game of conkers, so listen to this one if you don't know. The winner is the chestnut. The so basically you put them on strings and you crash them together. We would say dunch them together. Um, uh, the winner is the chestnut or the conker that demolishes the greatest number of its fellows. And there is much lore about this. Conkers comes from conqueror. Do you know? That's so obvious now, and I never realised the original name from the game when it was played with Cobnuts. I didn't even know that. So quite when the game arose is unclear, but it has been popular among school children from at least the 1850s. Children undergo some kind of chemical change in the autumn, seeking out the tree and pounding the lower branches with sticks to force the seeds to fall to the ground. We certainly used to do that. We used to throw the sticks up to try and knock them off. Uh, also, in recent years, concerns about safety have led a few local authorities to pollard or even cut down trees. Oh, goodness me. Norwich, to its shame, entertains such notions. They need disciplined. Um, some schools have banned the game. One headmaster requires competitors to wear safety goggles. I'm getting old, aren't I? Oh, goodness me. The World Conquer Championships on the second Sunday in October take place in Rothschild's model village of Ashton, Northamptonshire, with its mile-long avenue of horse chestnuts. It began in 1965 when a fishing trip was rained off. Disappointed, the group began a serious game of conkers, raiding the trees on the village green. Now the village is thronged. King Conker, the chief adjudicator, wearing a necklace and skirt of stringed conkers, one for each year of his reign, and hat covered in them, keeps a sharp eye out for malpractice among the crowds in a very English manner. The strict rules now govern the game countrywide. The Conquer Club has mapped all of the horse chestnuts in the parish, maintaining an eye on their condition. A leaf-mining moth newly arrived from Macedonia has begun to infest the trees, while a virulent fungal disease known as bleeding canker is also making inroads. First reported in the UK in the 1970s, the disease may be on the increase as mild winters and wetter springs encourage its spread. Well, that would be very, very great shame. When I was a boy, I used to love this time of year for that reason, really, because it was a big, we would get the conkers first and we'd go out and get those, then it would be Halloween. And Halloween never died out in North of England, but we used to carry turnip lanterns. We didn't do trick or treating, but there were certain customs such as apple bobbing and we used to eat scotch pancakes or drop scones, as they call them. And uh, there were various customs, you know, that we used to do. Uh, and it's harder to, a turnip is very hard to scoop out compared with the pumpkin. So some things are better now. But, you know, we, that never died out. We used to have Halloween parties. And fortune telling was a thing at Halloween as well. Not so much for the little ones, but I think for the older people. And then, of course, you'd have um, bonfire night, uh, which was Guy Fawkes night with all the fireworks on the 5th of November. And then it would be Christmas, and there would be a lead up to Christmas with at school. You'd be making things of, uh, well, rain. 
paper chains and uh, all sorts of stuff uh, and uh, oh candles and yeah it was very very good but getting back to conkers because i don't want to get ahead of myself really because we're only still in conker season it's still september so um we used to cheat and there was great we would there were tips hacks i think we'd call them these days and people would say they would make conkers out of plaster and paint them and enter the conquer games with these plaster conkers this is true uh, they would beat everybody and then you, you could uh, paint them with like a shellac thing as well uh, so they'd be shiny and they would have a plastic coat uh, there was all sorts of uh, basically chicanery that went on in the conquer games it was taken very seriously we never played it for money but yeah it was great fun going throwing sticks up so uh, and of course i mentioned before that sheila made some kind of body lotion out of them which i put on my hair but i've already told you that story That neatly, kind, sort of neatly, takes us into custom of the day. And I try to get as close as I can. As I've said, there's uh, a book by a very learned man who knows all about folklore and customs and all sorts of things to do with that called Steve Roud, I want to say, R-O-U-D, and it's called The English Year. And uh, I'll put a link in the show notes and etc. etc. It's an affiliate link. If you want to buy the book, I get a tiny, tiny, tiny amount. But... Uh, Many a muckle, max a mickle, as they say. So it's worth doing for me. I'm going to jump forward. It's actually only the 24th of September, but the, um, we're between the 21st of September, which is St. Matthew's Day, which is also, as you probably know, known as the Devil's Nutting Day. Okay. Um, St. Matthew brings on the cold dew. And to be fair, there has been a massive drop in temperature. It's actually quite cold recently, as if the air has completely changed. You know how hot it was even a month ago um, the sun was out today it wasn't too bad but anyway we're, we're between the 21st St Matthew's Day Devil's Nutting Day obviously or the 29th of September which is Michaelmas uh, the Feast of St Michael and All Angels so this is from Street, Steve Roud's book the Archangel Michael was extremely popular in England in the Middle Ages and hundreds of early churches were dedicated to him he was one of the figures portrayed killing a dragon and his reputation as captain of the heavenly host in the biblical war in heaven, Revelation 12, 7 to 12, 9, ensured his popularity with soldiers as well as with the general public. The one feature of Michaelmas that affected almost everybody in the country but is now almost entirely forgotten was the custom of eating roast goose on the day. The Michaelmas goose tradition was once stronger than the modern traditions of eggs at Easter and Turkey at Christmas combined, and as with most festival foods, there was a widespread idea that it was lucky to follow tradition and unlucky not to. As Robert Forby's Vocabulary of East Anglia, 1830, says, if you don't base the goose on Michaelmas Day, you want money all the year. And Jane Austen was clearly aware of the superstition when she wrote to her sister Cassandra on the 11th, 12th of October, 1813, which was the old-style Michaelmas Day before the change in the calendar. Um, I dined upon goose yesterday which I hope will secure a good sale of my second edition, it's old Jane. There has never been a satisfactory explanation for the goose-eating tradition, apart from the prosaic reason that geese are at their prime at the time. Once widespread but completely untrue historical story makes it our patriotic duty to do so. It was said that Queen Elizabeth I was eating goose on Michaelmas Day when she received and used the Spanish Armada had been defeated, and she declared that henceforth all true English people should eat the same on that day, in thanks and remembrance for our national delivery. The romance of this story notwithstanding, there is evidence that the connection between Michaelmas and the goose was already in place in the 15th century, that is to say before Good Queen Bess. It lasted into the early 20th century, but then rapidly faded from the national consciousness. Things do. Customs come and go, as you know. As one of the four quarter days, Michaelmas was an important time in legal and economic affairs from at least medieval times to the late 19th century. It was often the day that local courts were held, rents were due, annual employment terms expired, and was one of the days locally called Pack Rag Day, because so many families were busy changing their accommodation at the time, uh, also May the 14th. In local government, it was a favourite day for new mayors to be elected or to take office and was thus a day of civic pomp and ceremony. 
James Cottins described the scene in his youth in Exeter in the 1820s. The election of mayors for the city of Exeter under the old chamber was about Michaelmas. On the day of the election, the members of the body of freemen assembled in the Guildhall. The intended mayor was proposed with the other officials. After taking the oath and duly signing the documents, on the cheering subsiding, the hall echoed with the sound of various drawings of bottled wine corks, the liquor being freely passed around the table. A procession was then formed to perambulate the walls, headed by the tradesmen's corps of constables, about 24 in number, then the staff and mace-bearers, sword-bearers, the mayor-elect walking uncovered with his hat in hand, aldermen with scarlet robes and three-cornered hats, followed by members and officials, in the rear being the three tradesmen's sons named Mayor Stewards, the outside one being called Gutter Steward, wearing long black robes with tufts and three-cornered hats, who had the privilege of dining at the Mayor's banquets. Some of the electors and inhabitants would accompany the procession and give vent to their feelings by an occasional cheer. At two fixed points on the route, apples were thrown about for a general scramble. At another, wine was provided. The ceremony wound up in the evening with the good old English custom of dinner. A generation or two before this, Exeter's mare-making, like many other places, was accompanied by rougher activities and scrambling for apples. It was, the tra it was traditional on these occasions for the incoming mayor to supply a bull to be baited in the street for the people's amusement, and there was a curious local belief that just before the new mayor took office there was a lawless hour when normal laws and regulations had no effect. In Exeter, youths would dam up any streams or gutters to create pools of water with which they would soak passers-by if they weren't paid a fee. But in Kidderminster, Worcestershire, the people threw cabbage stalks at each other and then pelted the newly elected corporation with apples. Well, and I finally want to say something because I, I was going to stop there, but there's this very interesting little piece about blackberries. You know, I was saying I was eating them the other day. An extremely widespread, this is still Steve Rowe, by the way, an extremely widespread superstition found all over the British Isles maintained that blackberries were bad or even poisonous after a certain date. This date varied from place to place, ranging from Michaelmas to 10th or 11th October, and as the latter equates to the 29th of September before the change of calendar in 1752, it is clear that Michaelmas is the key day. The reason for the blackberry's sudden decline was the devil interfered on that day. My grandmother used to say this, definitely, and she believed it. In 1882, the Western Antiquary reported the belief that it's unlucky to eat blackberries after Michaelmas Day because His Royal Highness, you know who we mean, we won't say his name, then tampers with them, still lingers in Exeter and neighbourhood. Some time ago, whilst walking in the country round here, a young friend who was with me warned me against plucking any blackberries because, said he grimly, mm. it's past Michaelmas Day and the devil's been at them. In the polite version of this superstition, the devil puts his foot on the berries or wipes his club or tail over them, but in more graphic versions, he defiles them in more earthy ways. The belief certainly dates back to the early 18th century, but was particularly well known in the 19th. It can still be heard in some areas. Now, as I said, my grandmother used to say that. I never heard her say that about, she used to say about the devil got into them, but she didn't tell me about how, and I'm glad that neither she nor Steve were too graphic with me because I would have been sure. I still am not quite sure what they're talking about, but I can guess. Anyway, I don't need to this explained in the comments, please. I'm far too sensitive. Well, I think it's now time. Now, let me know if you are enjoying these kind of things. Put a little comment or review on the um, podcast and say something like custom of the week or the day is very interesting or custom of the day is tedious in the extreme and that'll help me because now i'm going on to legend of the week and this concerns nebworth house in hertfordshire so this is from jennifer westwood's book albion a guide to legendary britain so nebworth house very famous uh, manor house that you can visit very famous and of course, there used to be rock concerts there, probably still are, Nebworth, live at Nebworth. If you, if you search on Spotify or wherever you get your music, I've got, I've got Cobas because I like my high def music. Um, it was that, either that or Tidal. I was with Amazon, that high deficient for a while, but I like Cobas anyway, with a Q. Search wherever you are, live at Nebworth, and you'll see 
this is the same Nebworth, okay? So, it, and it says, one of Britain's most famous death warnings is the radiant boy now said to appear to members of the Lytton family at Nebworth House. His most celebrated manifestation was when he appeared to Lord Castlereagh some years before he ended his life on the 12th of August, 1822, by cutting his throat. Sir Walter Scott had heard Castlereagh speak of the radiant boy at one of his wife's supper parties in Paris in 1815, and seven years later wrote in a letter to Lady Abercorn. I'm not, I think I'll do it in a Scottish accent. I remember his once telling seriously and with great minuteness the particulars of an apparition which he thought he had seen. It was a naked child which he saw slip out of the grate of a bedroom while he looked at the, at the decaying fire. It increased at every step, it advanced towards him, and again diminished in size till it went into the fireplace and disappeared. I could not tell what to make of so wild a story told by a man whose habits were equally remote from quizzing or inventing a mere tale of wonder. The truth is now plain. The division had been the creation of a temporary access of his constitutional infirmity. So basically, Sir Walter Scott's being very kind there, and he's saying that, you know, Lord Castlereagh was given to fits of madness. Lockhart, I don't know who that is, who had often heard his father-in-law tell the story, well, I'm guessing it is Lord Castlereagh's father-in-law, adds to this that with its increase in size, the naked child assumed the appearance of a ghastly giant, pale as death, with a weeping wound on its forehead and eyes glaring with rage and despair. The sequence of events made a deep impression on Scott, who in his journal on 1st November 1826 wrote, He is gone. I shall always tremble when any friend of mine becomes visionary. One wonders whether Scott's frequent retellings of the story helped put it into general circulation, for Lady Abercorn had written from Florence in 1822, I never heard of his having named it to anyone else. Certainly the radiant boy was in the 19th century much aired, and a curious tale arose that cutthroat Castlereagh had himself appeared on the island of Stromboli at the moment of his death. As for the radiant boy, was he perhaps something more than a figment of Castlereagh's tormented imagination? Chillington Castle also had one till lately, according to Murray in 1873, 1873 I think they mean Chillingham Castle in Northumberland, and I think it's the Blue Boy. And so did Corby Castle on the Eden near Carlisle, who we've already spoken about, though he would not appear for P. Fraser Titler, the historian, who, having stayed there overnight on 8th November 1840, wrote to his sister, I have come away without seeing the radiant boy of Corby. This was extraordinary, for I had to walk to my bedroom every night through a long, dark gallery of which you could not see the termination with old warriors frowning down on me and the moon streaming in through the Gothic window at the end, circumstance which one would have thought any well-conditioned ghost would have profited by. The Reverend Sabine Baring Gould in his Yorkshire Oddities, 1874. Now, I should just put an aside, and he also wrote uh, the Book of Werewolves, which is a cracker, mentions a boy with a shining face who had been seen in certain houses in Lincolnshire and elsewhere, and of whom he had received an account from an old Yorkshire farmer who was nicknamed John Mealyface. That was the farmer. John M., that's to say John Mealyface, was riding one night to Thirsk when he suddenly saw pass him a radiant boy in a white horse. There was no sound of footfall as he drew nigh. Old John was first aware of the approach of the mysterious rider by seeing the shadow of himself and his horse flung before him on the high road. Thinking there might be a carriage with lamps, he was not unduly alarmed till by the shortening of the shadow he knew that the light must be near him, and then he was surprised to hear no sound. He thereupon turned in his saddle, and at the same moment the radiant boy passed him. He was a child of about eleven with a fresh, bright face. Had he any clothes on? And if so, what were they like? I asked. But John took no notice of particulars. The boy rode on till he came to a gate which led into a field. He stooped as if to open the gate, rode through, and all was instantly dark. How about that? Though one suspects that the expression radiant boy was bearing goulds and not the farmer's, John Mealyface's account, 
with its lack of particular sounds sufficiently genuine. Although, like the others, it postdates Scott. It may be that what Castlereagh saw was, if not a real ghost, at least a hallucination in the traditional mould. It must be said that the atmosphere at Nebworth was ripe for phantasms. Though the present mansion in the Gothic taste is romantic enough, it was evidently the old house, dating from 1563 and largely pulled down in 1811 or 12, that inspired the tradition. The novelist Edward Bulwer-Lytton, author of The Last Days of Pompeii, 1834, he also wrote a load of fantasy stories and horror stories, and I, I don't think I've ever done done one, and I must do. He was also very interested in magic, and I believe he was a member of the Golden Dawn. But anyway, I, I, he inherited Nebworth from his mother, was allowed as a boy, this is Edward Bulwer-Lytton, to roam that old half-feudal pile, and in a letter he wrote... I remember especially a long narrow gallery adjoining the great drawing room and hung with faded and grim portraits which terminated in rooms that were called haunted. They were of great antiquity, covered with gloomy tapestry and containing huge chimney pieces with rude reliefs set in oak frames grotesquely carved. In another room adjoining these, with a curious trapdoor that gave access to a chamber beneath it, if chamber it can be called, which had neither doors nor windows, this was known as the hellhole. How could I help writing romances when I had walked trembling at my own footsteps through that long gallery with its ghostly portraits, mused in those tapestry chambers and peeped with bristling hair into the shadowy abysses of hellhole? The Haunted Rooms were among those demolished, but were still in 1883 remembered with mingled pride and awe by a few aged inhabitants of Nebworth village. The old house was also truthfully described in a ghost story invented there one Christmas time in about 1800 by a Miss James, one of the guests. They had asked the gatekeeper and other villagers about the ghost, but no one knew anything other than there was one, so each member of the party set about writing its history. Miss James' story was entitled Jenny Spinner, or the ghost of Nebworth House, about an apparition whose spinning wheel was often heard, and who seems to have got her name from Arkwright's spinning Jenny. With memories of such a house still current, and with the habits of fantasy deliberately cultivated in it, it would not be surprising if Castlereagh saw, rather than for the purposes of dinner party conversation, said he saw the ghastly apparition of the radiant boy. Now, Jennifer Westwood helpfully says the Nebworth House and Park are open to the public. For time, see HHC and G, I don't know what that is. On Saturdays and Sundays, May to September, British Rail runs special excursions to Nebworth from King's Cross. Well, this was, book was written a long time ago, so I don't know if they do. Now, they're probably on strike. Never mind. Well, with all that excitement of... Um, we've had a lot of excitement through what custom of the week and legend of the month or whatever whatever I'm calling them uh, and we just need to calm down because we're here to sleep aren't we so I think it's about time for the bedtime story so I just need you to settle yourselves down get comfortable and I shall begin once you're sitting comfortably or lying comfortably so this is chapter two of the midnight folk by John Macefield and uh, chapter one was last week. How about that? That makes sense, doesn't it? So here we are, the Midnight Folk. Wicked Hill was a big round lump with a hollow top. The lower slopes grew bracken and bramble, but near the top nothing grew except short-bladed grass. The stump of an old gibbet stood at one end of it, an earthwork with two gates ringed the top of the hill. On the top of this earthwork the magic circle was burning in a narrow line of blue fire, which was being fed by little black cats who walked around the ring dropping herbs on it. That used to be my job when I did this kind of thing, Nibbins whispered. The bonfire, which had now sunk to a glow, was in the midst of the circle. The people who had danced about it were now drawn together in a group. They were listening to a wizard in a long scarlet gown, who seemed to be their king or chief. "'That's Abner Brown,' Nibbins whispered. "'He's always the head of these big parties.' "'Hush,' said Kay. "'Let's hear what he's saying.' 
So, my brothers and sisters, Abner was saying, we have had our evening's frolic. Now let us come to the evening's business. The great task before us is to find the Harker treasure. Here there were cries of, Hear, hear! We all know what it was. It was the treasure of the great South American Cathedral of Santa Barbara. It was a barge load of gold, silver, and precious stones, wrought and unwrought, but worth, as so the records prove, at least one million seven hundred thousand pounds. There are seven times seven of us. If we find it, the share of each one of us will be some thirty-five thousand pounds. I ask you, is it worth trying to find? There were loud cries of, Yes! You say yes, and you may mean yes, but will you all work for yes? There were shouts of, Yes, to the death. Very well, then, he said. I am glad we are all resolved. We will now break up our party, let the sevens leave the hill, except the Pouncer seven. When most of the party had gone, Kay saw that Mrs. Pouncer, Sister Nightshade, and the rest of the seven drew near to Abner. Sister Pouncer, Abner said, why are you vexed? Enemies are at work, she said. They took my broom and Nightshade's broom, so that we have had to walk. Do not be vexed, my pouncer, Abner said, because I am far from vexed. I have discovered something very important about the treasure. Oh? What, dear Abner? You are quite wrong about it. It is not in the Harker home, but somewhere near here. At this there came cries of, No, it cannot be. How can it be? Where do you suppose it is? Why is it not in the Harker house? Where is it? We will find out that presently, he said, of where it is. Listen to what I have to say of whereabouts it is. The seven drew nearer, intently listening. You know, Abner went on, that when I was little I helped my father and grandfather, both of them Abner Browns like myself, to look for the treasure. I might say I was at this quest from birth. Here there were remarks of, he here. As you know, my grandfather once had the treasure, but lost it. For more than twenty years, he and my father dug for it where they thought it would be. One of my earliest recollections is of helping them to dig for it in a hot country of very red mud. Then my grandpop disappeared, and within a week my pop died of the yellow fever. I had the harsh word to wrestle with before I could take up the quest. When I took it up, just thirty years after those two laid it low, it wasn't easy to pick up the threads at that place in the red mud. The yellow fever had killed most everyone who had lived there when my pop and grandpop dug there. But I met an old negro who just knew where my grandpop gave up digging and disappeared. He gave up digging because someone found the treasure, and carried it off to sea. He disappeared, so as to settle matters with that finder. The finder was an Englishman named Benito Trigger. That is not much to go upon, is it? Thirty-five years ago, an Englishman gets to sea with the stuff three thousand miles away and disappears. My grandpop goes after him and disappears. At first I thought that this Benito Trigger might be Captain Harker himself, for as we know, he lived for many years in quest of the treasure, or pretended to, so as to lull suspicion while he lived on it, Mrs. Pouncer said under her breath. But it was not Captain Harker, Abner continued, for when I came here to make inquiries I found that Captain Harker was at that time upon his deathbed. I need not tell you how interesting it was just to see the very house in which old Captain Harker lived, and to see his tomb, and to stand within just a few feet of those bones which, when they were alive, had started all this treasure hunt. For the moment I ruled him out. You didn't get the treasure, brother, I said. You were in your tomb before it could have reached England, if it ever did reach England. It was in his secret den before he ever sickened, Mrs. Pouncer muttered. Of course he had it. 
had it all the time. But, Abner continued, I fell right plumb in love with this green countryside, so full of real old buildings. So I just didn't rest till I'd taken Russell's Dean, that Queen Anne mansion in the Oakwood, where tradition says the Druids once practiced their rites. There, as you know, we have been able to establish our magic circle for the quest of the treasure upon the lines of the ancient knowledge. And there are red birds that come out of the wilderness with knowledge. One of them came to me this spring, just after I was settled in Russell's Dane. He led me to visit a certain church not many miles from here. And what did I find there? Here, some of the seven said, uh, the treasure, uh, some of the candlesticks, the church vessels in use again. No, none of those things, he answered. I found the tomb of my long-lost grandpop, Abner Brown. He had been drowned in the Great Flood here in February 1850. February Fildike, as you called it. Was not that wonderful. I have now raked out something of his end. He was last seen alive at the Condicate Inn, the Ring of Bells, on the last night of January 1850. He was then heard quarreling. With whom? with Sir Piney Trigger, a rich Honduras merchant who had just returned from two years' absence in the West. That Piney Trigger was the Trigger who had found the treasure and carried it off the sea. My grandpop had run him down. That night, after their quarrel, both my grandpop and Sir Piney disappeared. What happened, do you suppose? Many ask that at the time. I answer it. I say that Sir Piney had the treasure here, that my grandpop had discovered so much and asked for a share. They quarreled. I say that Sir Piney flung my grandpop into the flood and then fled the country, left the country, left the treasure, and never dared come back for it because of blood guiltiness. The case is reported in the Condicut Remembrancer for February 1850. They knew nothing of any treasure, of course, only inquired into the disappearance. The coroner's jury supposed him to have been washed out to sea by the Great Flood. Now, Sir Piney was a well-known sportsman, mixed up in many shady matters. His daughter is still alive. I have seen her. There's no getting anything out of her. What I have tried to find out is... What brought him to Condicut that night? In the coroner's notes I found this, that it was supposed that he had come to look after a big barge of his which had come up the river some days before. It was a seagoing barge, fitted like a yacht. He had been in her in the west. I say that he brought the treasure in her. He hid it somewhere, not far from Condicut, and had come to see it or to remove it when my grandpop interfered. Here, as Abner paused as though for applause, Sister Nightshade asked, M May he not have taken all the treasure away in the barge when he took himself away? No, Abner said, because the barge, dead empty, had been washed ashore and stove in in the floods two days before he disappeared. No, my sweet seven, depend upon it. The treasure is near here, and somewhere here... Probably near the river, we will find it. Here, there was a sensation among the company. All were very much impressed and excited. Sister Pouncer said, Was there ever such a mind as our Abner's, like crystal from the spring? But after saying this, she moved nearer to Kay and muttered, This is all pure surmise. You have a bee in your bonnet, my good sir. I too have my views of where the treasure is, and we shall see who is right. Magic is a surer guide than a grand pop, or a little pop, for all your tingo and tango. Sister Pouncer holds a silken clue. And now, my dear Seven, Abner continued, we will have one short dance more, and then away, for the stars are dim and the cocks are stirring on their perches. Join hands and dance. A strange music began from somewhere in the air, the witches and wizards at once swept into a dance. Nibbins was very uneasy. 
I can't keep out of a dance like this, he said. Oh, it goes right through my marrow. And then, in a minute, they will all join hands and swing round and round till they see all sorts of things. You come away, Kay said, pulling him down the hill. You always were one for getting into scrapes. Let's go back home before they all come hurrying for their horses. If Mrs. Pouncer catches us at the spindle trees, we shall be in a mess. He made Nibbins run, keeping one hand on the scruff of his neck all the way, lest the sound of the dance should prove too exciting. In a few minutes they were high in the air again upon their horses, sailing far from the hill. It's just as well we started when we did, Nibbins said, for there's the dawn beginning. Sure enough, the sky behind them was showing colour. The two horses began to droop down towards the ground. Presently they were dragging along the ground, and at last they collapsed. We left it too late, Nibbin said. However, we we're almost home. Come along, the gate's locked, but we can get over the wall by the ivy. They left the horses in the road, scrambled up the ivy over the wall, and then along behind the Loristinus till they were near the house. This is the place, Nibbin said. They were within thirty yards of the house in a thick shrubbery, but Nibbins must have touched a spring, for the ground gave way beneath them, and down they went into a secret passage. In another minute Nibbins was gone, and Kay was in his own room. What a night I have had, he thought. His slippers were muddy from the soil in the garden. I shall catch it, he thought. The cuckoo clock struck five. The room was quite light. He popped into bed at once. He didn't stay long awake, you may be sure. Just before he fell asleep, however, he heard a curious noise on the wall of the house not far away, as though the jasmine had broken away and was scraping as the wind blew it. Uh, I suppose it's the jasmine, he muttered drowsily, but it may be Ellen up already, sweeping the stairs. When he came downstairs to breakfast, the governess was not down. She entered just as he was at the sideboard helping himself to pork pie. She looked a little cross, as though she had not slept very well. You know, she said, that you're never allowed to help yourself to pork pie. It's very bilious, rich food, and then you won't be able to do your French. You must have an egg, like any other boy. And you don't mean to say, Kay, that after all the many times that I've spoken to you, that you've been in the garden again in your slippers, and on the beds too. And then you wonder if you catch your death of cold. Uh, but I haven't caught a cold, he said. Don't answer me back, sir, she said. You're a very naughty, disobedient little boy, and I have a very good mind not to let you have an egg. I wouldn't let you have an egg, only I had to stop your supper last night. Take off one of those slippers and let me feel it. Come here. Kay went up rather gingerly, having been caught in this way more than once. He took off one slipper and tendered it for inspection. Just as I thought, she said. The damp has come right through the lining, and that's the way your stockings get worn out. In a very pouncing way, she spanked at his knuckles with the slipper. He had expected a blow of the sort, and by drawing his hands swiftly aside, the slipper struck the spoons on the table and made them dance. Now, you naughty boy, put that slipper on, and you'll learn the whole of your pouvoir before you go out this morning. What were you muttering under your breath, Kay? Um, I, I was just wondering if this was a duck egg or a, a hen egg. Use the subjunctive and the genitive, she said. Were a duck's egg, not was a duck egg. And it's a hen's egg. Duck's eggs are a great deal too rich. At any other time, Kay would have boasted that it was a double yoker, but refrained, thinking that this would probably lead to confiscation as too much for a young stomach. He ate his egg, but his mind was intent on many other things. Ellen came in. If you please, ma'am, Ellen said. Would you mind speaking to Jane? Jane was at the door behind her. If you please, ma'am, Jane said. Would you please look at this? This was the dish on which the cold goose had lain. But alas, now nothing remained but a few picked bones and a skeleton, almost bare. The cats have been in again, ma'am. I don't know how they get in. And the chine's gone the same way. And there's two more brooms gone. Did you lock the larder door, Jane? Yes, ma'am, and I took the key, and I had it on my pillow, and if it isn't cats, and I don't know how the cats get in, then somebody must have a key and come in in the night, and I don't like it. I'll look into this after breakfast, Jane, the governor said, and I'll speak to Wiggins. Kay stared at the bones of the goose. He knew how that goose and chine had disappeared. 
Almost immediately, Jane reappeared. If you please, ma'am, Wiggins has found the two brooms, the besom and the broom broom. They were in the road outside near the spring. Well, how on earth could they have got there? The governess said. I don't know how they got there, Jane said, but I don't like it. The governess did not talk during breakfast, but seemed to be considering this question of the brooms and the goose. Kay's thoughts were far away with Nibbins, Mr. Bytham, and that gathering of witches on the hill. Of all the dreamy boys, the governess said suddenly, going off into daydreams. It's my belief you need a dose. It's my belief you eat too much. You'll put your boots on before you come to lessons and ask Ellen to dry those shoes in the oven. Please, can't I wear my slippers during lessons? No, you won't wear your slippers during lessons. For one thing, they're not dry and you'll catch your death wearing them. And for another, you fidget me distracted by rubbing one slipper off and then the other, just as though you were playing a game with them. This was a cruel thrust, because Kay did play games with them. When he had scraped off a slipper, he could push it about with his toes and imagine that it was a canoe full of redskins on the warpath going down the rapids, or a diving bell at Tobermory bringing up treasure from one of the ships of the Armada, or Great Grandpa Pahaka's ship, the Plunderer, engaging seven French privateers, or that famous horse lottery at various stages of the steeplechase, the prints of which hung in the study. But the boots were laced up things that gave no solace. There they were, and there you were. The governess stalked out of the room to investigate the larder door. Ellen came in to clear away. Kay looked up at the portrait of great grandmamma Siskin. Her eyes seemed all right. This is the loveliest time that I've ever had, Kay thought, and anything might happen. He walked slowly round the room, tapping the panelling. What are you doing, Master Kay? Ellen asked. I was just seeing if there are any secret passages, he said. Oh, there's no secret passages in here, Master Kay. What should there be secret passages for? Oh, Kay said, when people were doing murders, they always used to have them, and then smugglers had them. The smugglers were never here, Ellen said, not in this house. Down by the river the smugglers were, so my father said. They had the mill at seven hatches. Oh, and by the drowned man's copse way, they'd a place, and at the springs another. But they never could a come here. Your great-grandfather would never have allowed them. No, Kay said, but he would never have known. They could have crept in at night and made the passages. I don't think they could, Master Kay. Not in stone walls. Well, if you're still awake, I'll put you to sleep. I'm going to try to anyway. Last time I did a, a sleep meditation, I talked about sleep hygiene and things. I'm not going to talk about that again. We're just going to remind you that you are not your thoughts. So what keeps you awake is you having thoughts and revisiting all these scenarios, plans and worries and regrets and resentments and everything, and they just churn up emotions. So we don't need to think them. We are not our thoughts. If you hear your, your, your stomach gurgling or your heart beating, this is just things that those organs do and your brain thinks. But you're not your stomach and you're not your brain and you're not your heart. You, you know, you are you looking on. So it's possible to still be you without thinking. That's the point. So the first thing to do is put all your attention on the sound of the waves that's about to begin right now. And what you find is that when you're thinking about the waves, you don't think of anything else. And you don't think of your worries. So put your attention back on the waves. Just listen. Listen, really listen to them.
And when your mind drifts back to your thoughts, put them back on the waves. And just listen to the waves. The Nightmail by W. H. Jordan. This is a nightmail crossing the border, bringing the check and the postal order. Letters for the rich, letters for the poor, the shop at the corner, the girl next door. Pulling up at Beatick, a steady climb, the gradients against her, but she's on time. Past cotton grass and moorland boulder, shoveling white steam over her shoulder. Snorting noisily as she passes silent miles of wind-bent grasses. Birds turn their heads as she approaches, stare from bushes at her blank-faced coaches. Sheepdogs cannot turn her course, they slumber on with paws across. In the farm she passes no one wakes, but a jug in a bedroom gently shakes. Dawn freshens, her climb is done, down towards Glasgow she descends. Towards the steam tugs yelping down a glade of cranes, towards the fields of apparatus, the furnaces set on the dark plain like gigantic chessmen. All Scotland waits for her, in dark glens beside pale green lochs, men long for news. Letters of thanks, letters from banks, letters of joy from girl and boy, receipted bills and invitations to inspect new stock or to visit relations and applications for situations, and timid lovers' declarations, and gossip, gossip from all the nations. News circumstantial, news financial, letters with holiday snaps to enlarge in, letters with faces scrawled on the margin, letters from uncles, cousins and aunts, letters to Scotland from the south of France, letters of condolence to highlands and lowlands, written on paper of every hue, the pink, the violet, the white and the blue, the chatty, the catty, the boring, the adoring, the cold and official and the hearts outpouring, clever, stupid, short and long, the typed and the printed and the spelt all wrong. Thousands are still asleep, dreaming of terrifying monsters, or a friendly tea beside the band in Cranston's or Crawford's, asleep in working Glasgow. Asleep in well-set Edinburgh, asleep in granite Aberdeen, they continue their dreams. But she'll wake soon and hope for letters, and none will hear the postman's knock without a quickening of the heart, for who can bear to feel himself forgotten? The Adventures of Tom Bombadil Old Tom Bombadil was a merry fellow. Bright blue his jacket was and his boots were yellow. Green were his girdle and his breeches all of leather. He wore in his tall hat a swan wing feather. He lived up under hill where the withywindle ran from a grassy well down into the dingle. Old Tom in summertime walked about the meadows, gathering the buttercups running after shadows tickling the bumblebees that buzzed among the flowers, sitting by the waterside for hours upon hours. There his beard dangled long down into the water. Up came Goldberry, the river woman's daughter, pulled Tom's hanging hair, in he went a-wallowing, under the water lilies bubbling and a-swallowing. Hey, Tom Bombadil, whither are you going? 
said fair Goldberry. Bubbles you are blowing, frightening the finny fish and the brown water rat, startling the dab chicks and drowning your feather hat. You bring it back again, there's a pretty maiden, said Tom Bombadil. I do not care for wading. Go down, sleep again where the pools are shady, far below Willow Root's little water lady. Back to her mother's house in the deepest hollow swam young Goldberry, but Tom, he wouldn't follow. On knotted willow roots he sat in sunny weather, drying his yellow boots and his draggled feather. Up woke willow man, began upon his singing, sang Tom fast asleep under branches swinging. In a crack caught him tight, snick, it closed together, trapped Tom Bombadil, coat and hat and feather, Ah, Tom Bombadil, what be you a-thinking, peeping inside my tree, watching me a-drinking, deep in my wooden house, tickling me with feather, dripping wet down my face like a rainy weather. You let me out again, old man Willow. I'm stiff lying here. they no sort of pillow, your hard, crooked roots. Drink your river water. Go back to sleep again like the river daughter. Willow man let him loose when he heard him speaking locked fast his wooden house, muttering and creaking, whispering inside the tree. Out from Willow Dingle, Tom went walking on up the withy windle. Under the forest eaves he sat a while a-listening. On the boughs piping birds were chirruping and whistling. Butterflies about his head went quivering and winking, until grey clouds came up as the sun was sinking. Then Tom hurried on. Rain began to shiver, Round rings spattering in the running river. A wind blew. Shaken leaves, chilly drops were dripping. Into a sheltering hole, old Tom went skipping. Out came Badger Brock with his snowy forehead and his dark blinking eyes. In the hill he quarried with his wife and many sons. By the coat they caught him, pulled him inside their earth, down their tunnels brought him, inside their secret house. There they sat a mumbling, Oh, Tom Bombadil, where have you come tumbling, bursting in the front door? Badger folk have caught you. You'll never find it out the way that we have brought you. Now, oh, Badger Brock, do you hear me talking? You show me out at once. I must be a-walking. Show me to your back door under briar roses, then clean, grimy paws, wipe your earthy noses. Go back to sleep again on your straw pillow like fair Goldberry and old man Willow. Then all the badger folk said, We beg your pardon. They showed Tom out again to their thorny garden, went back and hid themselves, a shivering and a shaking, blocked up all their doors, earth together raking. Rain had passed, the sky was clear, and in the summer gloaming, old Tom Bombadil laughed as he came homing and locked his door again and opened up a shutter. In the kitchen round the lamp, moths began to flutter. Tom, through the window, saw waking stars come winking, and the new slender moon, early westward, sinking. Dark came on the hill. Tom, he lit a candle. Upstairs, creaking went, turned the door handle. Oh, Tom Bombadil, look what night has brought you. I'm here behind the door. Now, at last, I've caught you. You'd forgotten Barrow White dwelling in the old mound up there on the hilltop with the ring of stones round. He's got loose again. Under earth he'll take you, poor Tom Bombadil. Pale and cold he'll make you. Go out, shut the door and never come back after. Take away gleaming eyes, take your hollow laughter. Go back to grassy mound on your stony pillow. Lay down your bony head like old man Willow, like young Goldberry and badger folk in burrow. Go back to buried gold and forgotten sorrow. Out fled Barrow White through the window leaping, through the yard over wall like a shadow sweeping. Uphill, wailing, went back to leaning stone rings, back under lonely mound rattling his bone rings. Old Tom Bombadil lay upon his pillow, 
sweeter than Goldberry, quieter than the willow, snugger than the badger folk or the barrow dwellers, slept like a humming top, snored like a bellows. He woke in morning light, whistled like a starling, sang, Come Derry doll, merry doll, my darling. He clapped on his battered hat, boots and coat and feather, opened the window wide to the sunny weather. Wise old Bombadil. He was a wary fellow. Bright blue his jacket was, and his boots were yellow. None ever caught old Tom in upland or in dingle, walking the forest paths or by the withy windle, or out on the lily pools in boat upon the water. But one day Tom, he went and caught the river daughter in green gown, blowing hair, sitting in the rushes, singing old water songs to birds upon the bushes. He caught her, held her fast. Water rats went scuttering, reeds hissed, herons cried, and her heart was fluttering. Said Tom Bombadil, here's my pretty maiden. You shall come home with me, the table's all laden. Yellow cream, honeycomb, white bread and butter, roses at the window sill and peeping round the shutter. You shall come under hill, never mind your mother, in her deep weedy pool. There you'll find no lover. Old Tom Bombadil had a merry wedding, crowned all with buttercups, hat and feather shedding, his bride with forget-me-nots and flag lilies for garland, was robed all in silver green. He sang like a starling, hummed like a honeybee, lilted to the fiddle, clasping his river maid round her slender middle. Lamps gleamed within his house, and white was the bedding. In the bright honeymoon, badger folk came treading, danced down under hill, and old man Willow tapped, tapped at window pane as they slept on the pillow. On the bank, in the reeds, river woman sighing, heard old Barrow White in his mound crying. Old Tom Bombadil heeded not the voices, taps, knocks, dancing feet, all the nightly noises, slept till the sun arose, then sang like a starling, Hey, come Derry doll, merry doll, me darling, sitting on the doorstep, chopping sticks of willow, while fair Goldberry combed her tresses yellow.